Before the video starts, just a quick reminder to go check out The Chilling App. If you can't get enough content from me here on this channel, myself and other narrators here on YouTube are providing hours of unique and spine-tingling scary story narrations exclusively over on Chilling. There's new narrations for me added weekly, and there's new professional narrators constantly being added to the list. There's literally hundreds of hours of scary stories to binge on, from monsters, paranormal, thrillers, and true scary stories. The Chilling app even has classic novels, true crime stories, and chilling original series. And this all can be enjoyed with their one-of-a-kind ambient menu, where you can mix in immersive and relaxing sound effects like a crackling fire, dark storms, and chill rain, and adjust their volumes independently in a sleep timer so you can drift off to dreamland without interruptions after. And guess what? They just added the ability to download stories you're listening to, so you can listen offline now as well. Click the link in the description or the pinned comment to try the free trial of the Chilling app, and after that it's only $2.99 a month, which makes it completely ad and interruption free. And don't forget, Chilling is giving away an Xbox Series X bundle with Elden Ring. There's another link down below with simple instructions on how to enter. A winner will be announced March 31st, 2022. Best of luck, and enjoy the stories. I remember walking out of Walmart with a cart full of gardening supplies a few years back. My mom had sprained her wrist and needed stuff picked up for the start of spring, so it was down to me to go grab some stuff for her. I'm loading the stuff into the trunk of my car when I happen to notice someone walking past me out of the corner of my eye. Kind of took me off by surprise, so I turned around out of instinct and ended up making eye contact with this younger looking guy. He looked like 20 something workout gear, shaved head, totally normal looking guy who looked like he'd been out for a run or something. I didn't want to seem all confrontational or whatever, so I smiled and said, hey, and just carried on loading all the stuff into my trunk. Next thing I hear is someone saying, was it you? I turn again, and it's the same guy, smiling back at me, having asked me that question. I'm like, was what me? And the guy responds like, you know. I sort of chuckle, thinking it was an honest mistake on the guy's part, thinking I was just someone else or whatever, so I tell him I don't know what he's talking about, then just carry on loading the stuff into my trunk. That's when I hear him walking towards me from his footsteps, so I turn around, hoping things aren't about to get confrontational. But those hopes were totally dashed when I saw the look on his face. He looked livid. And as I'm getting ready for the unfortunate event of having to fight a total stranger for no reason, the guy starts screaming at me. Don't pretend you don't know. You got me transferred. It's because of you I got transferred. He said a bunch of other stuff that might have you censoring this post, so I won't repeat it, but trust me when I say it was language that would have made a stevedore blush. I remember one of the scariest things being how he was still sort of smiling as he started shouting about being transferred, and then as he carried on screaming at me, he went bright red in the face, got this look about him like he was about to murder me, and he actually started spitting as he was screaming due to how out of control he was getting. I'm telling him to calm down that there's been some kind of mistake, and that's all without even asking what he meant by got me transferred. But then every time I try to reason with the guy, he almost takes it like I'm trying to gaslight him or whatever and it just makes him angrier. I don't even know how he managed to conceal it on him, but he pulled out this extendable baton from somewhere and whips it open right in front of me before charging at me. I just reacted, running around my car and screaming for other people in the parking lot to call 911. That was the other scary thing, how most people just stood and watched with their mouths open instead of either calling someone or actually getting involved to help. Then the other really scary thing, the guy's screams as he chased me, they went from actual words to just this wild psycho babble, just stuff that barely made sense and only had an actual understandable word every three or four screams. He was completely manic, 
and it really didn't hit me at the time, but I later found out that he was suffering from a complete mental break. He was way faster than me too, so if it wasn't for me being able to duck and dodge around parked cars, he would have caught up with me in seconds. And then because I didn't have anything to defend myself with, just bags of compost and seeds and whatnot, he might have actually been able to bash my head in and there's not a thing I've been able to do about it too. Eventually, some hero of a security guard from a movie theater of all places, he actually ran over and tried tackling the guy chasing me. But this psycho kid swung at him a few times with his baton and then the guy was forced to back off and try to tackle him when he had his back turned, which obviously wasn't easy because the kid was in this like super saiyan manic state. Every time he got close, the kid just clocked him, turned, and started swinging. But then, that gave me a window to put some more distance between us. The guy might have actually saved my life in that way. Anyway, the cops showed up after what seemed like way too long, but when they tried tasing the guy, it just had absolutely no effect on him. That was the other thing that scared me. I've actually seen a guy getting tased before, it's a long story, and when the wire things hit him, he just seized up and hit the floor like a statue. But this guy, it just had zero effect on him. Maybe it was a broken taser or whatever, but it was still pretty terrifying to see. The cops wouldn't go into too much detail with me, but the kid was known to him as suffering from paranoid schizophrenia, and I went from hating the kid to actually feeling really sorry for him incredibly fast. They'd been getting calls about him for the past two days, but he kept on running from the scenes of the calls and getting away before they could actually take him into custody. I don't feel any ill will towards him, and I hope he got the help that he needed. But I'm not kidding when I say he legit could have killed me that day. Easily the scariest thing that's ever happened to me at Walmart. Last January, I was working as an associate at the Walmart over in Lake Charles. I was working second shift, so that's 1pm to 10pm, and it was about 7pm when people started to notice some kind of drama going off in the parking lot. The greeter noticed it first, and was actually getting ready to have someone call the cops, but the whole thing seemed to die down, and then, from what I heard, things sort of just chilled out. I asked a coworker if anything juicy had happened, and she said no but that the drama was between two groups of teenage girls and that one of the groups had walked into the store. They weren't being loud or obnoxious or anything, not at first anyway. They were just walking up and down the aisles talking among themselves and one of the girls seemed to be making a video of them just hanging out. I remember hearing one of the girls saying something like, man, I need my taser back. But I just put that down to them talking smack after almost getting into a fight or something. The other thing I know is that loss prevention was watching them after one of them seemed to take something out of the kitchen utensils section, but they were just keeping their distance and observing until they tried to make an exit for the store. This is actually super relevant to what happened later on too, so keep it in mind. Anyways, I went back to what I was doing, then the next thing I know, there's all kinds of screaming coming from near the front section of the store. I walked around to see what was going on and that's when I see a group of girls in the doorway shouting at the group that was inside. They were all saying all this stuff like, where are y'all at? Come out. They knew the other group had walked inside the Walmart and were obviously trying to find them. The greeter was trying to get them to calm down or leave, saying they could either stop making a scene or was going to call the cops, but neither group was paying him any mind. Then, one of the girls in the doorway group starts saying something threatening and the other is all like, I'm about to come out as soon as my sister gets here. But the other girl didn't want to wait for that. She just walks inside the store and marches straight over to this girl with dyed blonde hair. I'm like, ah snap, this is about to go off right here. And honestly, just like that, the two girls start throwing hands at one another in that typical girl fight way, just flailing their hands at one another. Then the girl with blonde hair, she reaches for something in her pants and although I didn't see it clearly, she swings at the other girl's chest, and it looks a lot like she just punched her. But then as soon as the hit connected, the blonde girl, like, 
backed up, then ran off while the other girl just sort of staggered back, then looked down at her chest. I didn't see the blood, not right away, I just heard the screams. What I did see was the girl who had been hit stagger a few steps, then just collapse on the floor. Then when her friends dropped down and rolled her over, that's when I saw the blood on the floor. The EMTs were called, the girl was taken away in an ambulance, and we were all basically tasked with comforting the girl's friends as they were absolutely all shooken up that they just watched their girl get stabbed. Then, about 9pm, because we had to empty the store out so the cops could do their thing, I was told I could finish early so I could go home and basically and try and get the whole thing out of my head. But then like a half hour after I walked through the front door of my parents' place, I get an Instagram DM from one of the younger co-workers that I was tight with. They ask something like, you were working second shift tonight, right? And I respond, yeah, some messed up stuff happened. Then the next thing they send me is this long link that had Facebook in there somewhere. I figured it'd just be a sharing of a news story about the whole stabbing thing, but when I opened up the link, it opens up one of those Facebook Live videos and instantly I knew what I was watching. I knew what I was watching because, one, I recognized one of the girls from the stabbing at work, and two, they're saying things like, that was too much, and if she killed her, she killed her, and then like shrugging it off as if though it was her fault for coming at them and her friend was just defending herself. And then it got way worse. They were literally bragging how they killed someone, and they knew they killed someone too. I mean, I just thought the girl would be taken to the ER or something, but they knew she'd stabbed her in the heart because she aimed to stab her in the heart. We didn't find out until the next day that the girl who got stabbed had died on the way to the hospital. The most effed up thing though, none of those girls looked older than my little sister, who was a high school freshman at the time. Some of them barely looked like they'd gone through puberty yet. I mean, these were literally kids, literally effing children, and they just killed somebody and were proud of it. I think maybe it was just that they were trying to hide how scared they were, or trying to establish the whole self-defense thing before the cops came looking for them. But my god, seeing that kind of savagery coming out of a kid made my heart break for humanity a little. Those girls had ruined their lives with one little fight, and even worse, they'd literally ended another girl's. Taking her away from her family, friends, all she had going for her in life, all because of one stupid fight. I used to work the late shift at a Walmart here in Jacksonville, and Every night after finishing at like 1 in the morning, I'd walk to the exact same bus stop to call an Uber. Now, this whole story would never have happened if my dumb self didn't just get picked up from work, but I always like having a smoke as soon as I finished and it wasn't the kind of thing that management would have taken kindly to, me smoking right outside of the Walmart. It was the arrested and fired kind of smoke, so I used to walk to the bus stop. Anyway, this one night I'm sitting there, smoking away and the Uber is maybe only 3 or 4 minutes away. Seconds later, when I see this dude in the distance walking towards the bus stop, I immediately started getting bad vibes. Getting bad vibes from people when I was smoking up was hardly anything out of the ordinary, but I still figured that I'd keep an eye on him as he walked past, just in case he tried anything funny. He walks past me, but only by a few feet and then he stops and leans against the bus stand like he's waiting for the bus with me. Now, I know well that there's no bus coming, so why is he just standing like there like he's waiting for one? That's when the bad vibes about the guy seriously intensified because he was definitely acting weird. The only question was if they had any bad intentions for me. I'm getting more and more nervous watching the little blip on my phone screen getting closer and closer and... As much as I'm trying not to make eye contact with the guy, I can see him looking over at me every so often, like he's sizing me up or something. I'm feeling pretty thankful by the time my Uber rounds a corner and I start to see its headlights, but as it pulls up, I actually think that maybe my paranoia might be starting to get the better of me, 
and maybe it's just me being the judgmental one instead of the guy actually posing any kind of threat. Then literally, as I open the door to the Uber, the guy says, You lucky kid. I look back, and he has this grin on his face that literally made my skin crawl. That's when I realize he did actually have something in mind for me. I don't know what it was, whether or not he planned on robbing me or just beating me up or whatever it was. I just know it wasn't good, and I thank Christ that my Uber showed up when it did. When I was in my early 20s, I used to work at one of the Walmarts here in Topeka, Kansas. It's the one north of the river for anyone interested, and for the most part, it was the most boring, soul-crushing job I had ever worked in my life. Working with the public sucks hard, and as much as you can meet some super nice people on the job, the worst of the worst managed to spoil the entire experience somehow. Most of the worst people were just annoying, making insane complaints about stuff we have no control over. But every so often, someone or some group of people did something that genuinely makes you question whether humans even deserve to exist. Like when someone decided to edit one of the children's books. So, I'm walking down one of the aisles one day, when some lady marches up to me like, Excuse me, young man, but I want to speak to the manager of this place right now. This is way before the whole Karen thing, but this woman definitely seemed like a Karen. I mean, who complains about something in a kid's book? If you don't like it, don't buy it, right? That was my thought process at the time, but honestly, I was really wrong to assume that about her, because she had every right to be angry and disgusted about what she was about to show us, and I actually feel really guilty admitting that right now. Anyway, I knew our store manager was in his office, so being the nice guy that I am, I invited her to follow me to where the staff area was, then wait for him to grab Tim, the manager that was on duty that day. I walk into Tim's office and say, Hey yo, Tim, some lady's about to blow a gasket over a kid's book. Tim rolls his eyes, sighs, then follows me onto the shop floor to talk to her. It was kind of funny to see him go from screw this lady to, good afternoon ma'am, how may I be of assistance today? With this really sunny smile on his face. And I swear, people who work with the public like that could out-act Hollywood actors sometimes. Anyway, the lady thrusts the kid's book at him and then starts yapping about how we should be ashamed that stuff like that book was out on the shelves. He takes the book off of her, opens it up, and is clearly about to ask what the problem is, when all of a sudden, I watch his eyes go all wide as his mouth just drops open. He slams the book shut, turns to me and says something like, uh, Robbie, uh, go check every single kid's book that's on the shelves. Take everything that's been defaced and uh, just put them on the office desk. I remember thinking like, defaced? What do you mean defaced? But I didn't say anything out loud, I just did as he asked, walked back to where the kid's books were, then started flicking through them to see what the deal was. That's when I saw that same sick-in-the-head idiot had not only defaced the kid's book, but they'd done it in the most obscene ways imaginable. It wasn't just that they'd drawn huge, well, let's say, extras on the groin areas of some of the characters, like those were just dumb and gross. It was the characters they'd drawn X's on the eyes of, with captions like, I'm dead and your mom and dad are going to be dead soon too. Then there was this one picture that had like a dad and young daughter playing on a swing set. He was pushing her, and she was all happy, smiling, saying, Hi, your daddy. I don't even want to repeat what they changed the speech bubbles to. It genuinely was sickening the kind of stuff that they had written in there, stuff that honestly doesn't bear repeating. Like, think of the worst possible thing a dad could say to his little girl, then times it by a hundred, and I remember wondering how seriously messed up a person has to be to even think of stuff like that in the first place. Whoever had done it, they hadn't just done it to one book either. It was every single one on the top of each stack, and they'd even slip some into the backs of the display units too, like they wanted to slip a few in there that we might have missed and still sell or something. All the violent death stuff was one thing, but... 
It was the X-rated stuff that made me feel actually sick as I flicked through the books to make sure all the defaced ones had been removed. Once all that was done and Tim had given the offended lady some coupons as a way of an apology, he went about checking all the security camera footage to find the person or people responsible. That's how we found out something seriously shocking. It wasn't just some messed up customer that was doing it. It was one of our own associates that was editing the books with all that evil stuff. I'm not sure how they run things these days, but back when I was working there at the North Topeka Walmart, we had our own dedicated cleaning team that would clean the place down before opening hours. They'd come into work for a few hours before anyone else was there and get all the cleaning done before the rest of the team showed up. That's how they had a chance to be alone with the kids' books like that, and when no one was watching them. No one except the cameras, of course. And they would grab a pen from the office supply section, then head over to the kids' book to deface them in that evil, messed-up way. I know they got fired as a result, and I think the legal department tried to sue them for the stock loss or something, but the whole process was really long and drawn out, and whenever I asked Tim about it, he just told me that upper management hadn't updated him on anything. I ended up moving jobs just before I found anything more out, and how it stayed out of the news I have no idea, but I know for certain that the cops couldn't press any charges because she hadn't actually committed any actual crimes, I guess. I think obscenity laws only applied to publishers or public displays or whatever, but you'd think there'd be something you could charge a person like that with, especially because they were trying to expose kids to such evil stuff. Quite some time ago, my wife passed away from a brain aneurysm. Since then, it's just been me and my daughter. As you can imagine, I'm very protective of her, and my brother says my protectiveness verges on unhealthy sometimes. Truth is, he has no idea how right he is. You see, I've gone to some real extremes to ensure my daughter's safety. In fact, I've gone to some real extremes to make sure everyone's kids are a little bit safer. And if you think that sounds a little cryptic, it won't for long. And honestly, I don't care if people don't believe this. If y'all don't believe this, then the cops won't believe this. And that means I'll get to spend longer with my daughter, and that some might feel I have the right to. Being a single father with little in the way of formal education, I've really struggled to make ends meet at times. Some years, almost all of my purchases have been made at either flea markets, secondhand stores, or Walmart. And the last of these are where my story begins. I remember picking out school supplies for my daughter and she couldn't decide on which stuff she liked the most, so she kept asking for more than one set. I was faced with the humiliating and painful situation of telling her that we just couldn't afford to buy her everything she wanted. Trying to put that into terms a kid can understand without having it damage their sense of self-worth, that's one of the hardest things a parent can ever face. Then out of nowhere, I hear a guy behind me saying something like, Maybe I can help with that. I turn around to see a middle-aged man smiling at me and my daughter. He explained that he could give us financial help. All I had to do was take a chance and keep an open mind. I'm checking for someone recording us on their phone in case it was one of those social media charity things where they're expecting me to break down in tears and hug the guy for offering to buy our groceries or whatever. But we were the only people in the aisle, and unless someone happened to be recording from some hidden vantage point, it seemed like we were totally alone. I won't lie, I could have done with some financial aid at that point, but I didn't exactly feel comfortable just taking a handout. Then on top of that, something about the situation just didn't feel right. So as much as I thanked the guy for the offer, I straight up told him that I wasn't some charity case. He then tells me he isn't offering me any charity, but rather an opportunity, and since I needed the scratch so bad that, at that point, I was willing to hear the guy out. I asked him what he was offering, and he takes a few steps closer to me and just says, I'm from a modeling agency, and I'd like to take some pictures with your daughter. Only a complete lunatic would just approach a total stranger in a Walmart and ask to take pictures with their seven-year-old daughter if their intentions weren't pure. That's what really caught me off guard. 
like I didn't immediately assume the guy was some kind of kitty diddler. Those kinds of scumbags don't just reveal themselves in broad daylight like that, right? And if he was, if the offer was genuine, then there was some kind of seedy motive to the whole thing. I wanted to take it as far as I could reasonably go so I could report the guy to the cops. But then, what if he legitimately was from a modeling agency? I knew that was a thing, and I'd actually had another parent whose kids went to the same elementary school suggest I take my daughter to an open casting, since all the other parents talked about how adorable she was. So, I played along, asking him what kind of pictures and how much he was offering. He told me he'd pay me a thousand bucks for what he called a photo shoot with my daughter. But then again, if I wanted to get paid, I'd have to keep an open mind about the nature of the shoots. I press him on what he means by open mind, and he starts in on how they'd be artistic but tasteful. I think that's what swung it. I've only heard terms like artistic but tasteful used in reference to a very particular kind of modeling, and it was mostly, certainly not any kind I wanted my kid to be a part of. I think it took every shred of mental composure to keep my skin from visibly crawling, but I put on my best appreciation face and nodded, then asked him for his cell number so I could inform him of when we'd be free. That's when he insists on taking my number instead, presumably so I couldn't just go straight to the cops with it just in case I was, well, doing exactly what I was planning on doing. Again, that pretty much sealed it in my mind. If the guy was legit, if he had nothing to hide, why not give me a card or just be cool with giving me his number? Once we parted ways, I felt disgusting for even faking any kind of enthusiasm. I know the guy just thought I was adult and that he could just manipulate me based on a dire financial situation. But even so, I was actually kind of disgusted with myself for just not strangling the guy as soon as I worked out what his game was. I never figured myself as any kind of vigilante or amateur detective, but once the idea of getting the guy caught and arrested had entered my mind, there was just no shaking it. And that's how I ended up hatching a plan. I'd meet up with a guy, earn his trust, get a name, maybe even a full name, a photo, or his cell, along with any kind of location the guy hung out at, and then I'd just pass all the information onto the cops in the hopes that they'd be able to get the guy in cuffs. The worst case scenario, the guy was just a socially awkward freelance photographer. Best case scenario, I'd be helping to get a predator off the streets. I'd be doing the local community a huge, huge favor. Heck, I'd be doing the whole world a favor. A child's innocence is something that is beyond sacred, and anyone who dare take that away from them, they belong in a cage for decades or more. Once I was set on my little plan, I remember sitting at my kitchen table practically staring at my phone for the entire evening. He didn't tell me exactly when he'd call, just that he would call, and that it'd be sometime later on that day. I got two unrelated calls that evening and I either cleared the line when it was someone already in my contacts or just hung up immediately when it was some cold calling numbskull wanting to know if I was happy with the internet service. The call didn't come until just before midnight and when it did, I once again had to summon up all my strength not to scream obscenities down the line at him. The worst part is when he let slip that he figured that I was basically on level with the whole thing and that I'd just be cool with exploiting my daughter for cash. He even hinted that I might be like him, so to speak, and that I could make even more money very quickly if I was open to having her do other things. I had to quickly move the negotiations along to keep from smashing my phone to pieces against the table, I'm sure you can understand. It took way longer than I'd have preferred, and I guess he just wanted to probe to see if I wasn't a narc, but eventually... We arranged a time and a place to meet and I promised the guy I'd bring my daughter along so he could take his pictures of her. Again, I can't be too liberal with the details here, but let's just say the meeting was at an extremely isolated location that took me a long drive to drive out to. That might have suited him, but unknowing to him, that suited my agenda too. The only problem was, he wouldn't be alone. I should have known that guys like that wouldn't work alone and I was foolish for thinking that they'd be some kind of soft target. 
Up until that point, all I wanted to do was get as much info as I could. Maybe smack the guy around a little. Maybe even perform some kind of citizen's arrest. I don't know. But that was all predicted on him being dumb enough to conduct his little operation on his own. And when I showed up without my daughter and found that there were three guys running the little studio, that threw a gigantic wrench into the works of my plans. Obviously, because I showed up alone, their first question was asking where my daughter was. Luckily for me, I was able to think on my feet, and they seemed satisfied with my answers that my daughter was back in the car, and I wanted to make sure everything was legitimate before I brought her up to the studio. In order to seem more convincing, I acted as if though I was keen to see what kind of outfits they had in mind for her, and when they showed me, I once again had to mask my disgust. I also pretended like I was concerned about security, wanting to see what kind of measure they'd put in place to ensure that they wouldn't be found by the cops or uncovered by some FBI agent trawling the internet for underage content. I didn't really understand any of the more technical stuff they told me, but I've seen enough episodes of Mr. Robot to know what Tor masking was and that it helped them stay off the grid in terms of law enforcement detection. Not long after that, the moment of truth arrived. But like I said, I was only prepared for one guy, maybe two at the most. I wasn't prepared for three, especially not the guy they'd obviously picked out to act as security. He was a bear of a man, at least six foot and change, and as soon as I noticed he was open carrying, I knew I'd bitten off more than I could chew. I had my own pistol, of course, hidden, stuffed in the back of my jeans, but I only kept the thing around the house in case of home invaders. It's not like I took it down to the range every week. Whereas the bear man, he looked like a real type of gun guy. The kind of man who took pride in being able to shoot the butt off of a fly at 300 yards. I remember telling the guys that I'd go fetch my daughter from the car and that I'd be back in a minute or so. I wasn't planning on going back, of course. I was going to get out of there with 911 on speakerphone. But, as you can imagine, it wasn't exactly those guys' first rodeo. And as soon as I told them that I was walking back to my car, the bear man politely announced that he'd walk with me. And I knew I was screwed. I knew that as soon as he saw that my car was empty, he'd either beat me to a pulp for having wasted their time, or worse, he'd think I was a cop and empty his clip into me before I even had a chance to tell them the whole truth. As we walked, I kept my mind ticking over, answering his small talk questions with nothing but pleasant sounding grunts as I tried to work out how I was going to get out of there in one piece. When he noticed that there was no one on the passenger side of my car, I bought myself a minute by telling him that she'd gone asleep on the back seats. Long early morning drive had taken it out of her. He smiled at that, then put on my best sleazebag impression and told him that he was welcome to check out the goods. He smiled again, but that time it was a different kind of smile. A smile that no man should ever have in relation to a child. It made me want to smash his teeth in. But even then, I didn't want to kill him. I didn't think I had it in me to kill anyone, even over something as evil as exploitation. But like so many other things in life, I was wrong. The bear man walked over to the rear door of the car and lowered himself down so he could peer through the sun glare on the window. When he looked back at me with this look of confusion on his face, it quickly changed to a look of fear, because he saw my gun, and he saw it, pointed at him. I told him to take his gun from his hip and toss it over to me, which he did, and as scared as he looked, he somehow managed to look a hundred times as fearful when he asked me if I was a cop, and I said no. He then asked if I was going to kill him, and again I said no. But in that moment, I also realized that I hadn't brought anything along to restrain the guy. I also wasn't dumb enough to think that I'd be able to tie the guy up with nothing but the rags of his shirt or whatever, not without him being able to rip his way out of it or overpower me in the process. I guess what I did next is the result of watching too many movies. But I figured I'd just be able to knock the guy out by hitting him around the head with the butt of my pistol. I walked towards him slowly made like I was reaching for some handcuffs or something, and then just hit him on the side of the face as hard and as fast as I could. On TV, the hero just hits the bad guy in the face and then he falls down and 
just doesn't get up until it's convenient for the plot line. But that's not what happens in real life. That's not what happened to me either. Because when I hit the guy, he did hit the ground. But he didn't stop moving. He laid there, groaning, cradling his head in his hands, but he didn't just lay still like I figured he would. So I hit him again, harder that time, just, just behind his ear. I remember seeing a trickle of blood leaking out of his ear as he started violently shaking. And then it hit me. If he died, or even if he didn't, and his partners could burn everything incriminating from their studio, they could have me in cuffs before the end of the day. They had my number. I'd seen my face. They probably had pictures of me if they had security cameras installed in their studio. I'm not saying I was certain that these scumbags were about to pretend like they were law-abiding citizens, but I knew I'd put myself in a difficult position. And even if they didn't go down that route, if the guy woke up and I was still working his buddies over at the studio, it could be game over for me. Like I said, I was never planning on killing anyone, but things just sort of escalated. I rolled the guy over, still in mid-seizure and knowing that his partners would hear if I shot him, I stood on his throat and leaned into my step until he stopped moving. Then, once I was sure that he was done for, I couldn't let the rest of them live, and that was a risk I just wasn't willing to take. With their security gone, the rest of the task was much simpler. As soon as I knocked on the big iron door and the little latch slid back, I just told the second guy that Bear Man was making sure my daughter was ready, and he let me back inside. Guy was dumb enough to keep his back to me on the walk up to the studio, and as soon as I had my eye on the smiling man from Walmart, I put my gun up again, aimed it at the back of the second guy's head, and then pulled the trigger. Walmart guy just about soiled himself, and was begging me not to kill him by the time I had the gun trained on him. I asked him where the duct tape was, or the riot cuffs, or they used to restrain the kids if they tried to escape, or for when they wanted to do other things to them. And lo and behold, they had a drawer full of the stuff. And when I told the guy his only chance at saving his life was binding his own ankles, he complied. I made him get started on his wrists too, then approached slowly and gave the duct tape a few loops around his hands too. I tried to make him talk me through how to delete everything they'd had uploaded on their servers, but unfortunately, I'd already killed the guy who knew all the technical computer stuff. The best I could do was pile up all their computer stuff in the center of the room, head out to my car to grab a gas can of emergency gas from the trunk, and set it all on fire. But not before I attempted to extract every piece of information I could from the guy about where he was uploading to, contacts he might have. Everything that might help shut down whatever network he was a part of. He talked for exactly 47 minutes, and I know that because I put my phone down in front of him and recorded everything he had to say to me. And when he was done, I put a bullet in his head, and then one in his heart to make sure he was dead. And then before I left, like I already said, I doused all their computer equipment with gas and set the whole place on fire. Then I went back home, showered, and called my sister to see if my daughter was okay staying over another night at her place. The studio was so remote that I don't think anyone even noticed the fire. I certainly didn't see anything in the news about it, let alone the mess I'd left back there. And I like to say that the only real anxiety or worry I felt was the possibility of some kind of brush or forest fire, but honestly, that's not the case. I hear a lot of people saying things like, I could hang a predator and sleep like a baby that same night. And maybe for them that's true. But not for me. No matter how exhausted I was, no matter how much I drank, I kept seeing a looping reel of three different things. The first was how the bear man went into a seizure when I hit him the second time. The second was how the contents of the second guy's skull just sprayed out of his face when I shot him from behind. And the third was how the Walmart guy literally squealed as he begged me not to shoot him when he was done spilling his guts out about all the people he'd worked with. I was left in this limbo of not regretting what I'd done, but also being haunted by it and wishing it never happened. Wishing it never had to happen either. I could have gotten everything I needed from just one guy, 
without having to kill anyone. I mean, I doubt they would have gone on to turn their lives around or anything, and I know the world is a better place without them, but I just wish it wasn't me that had to do a job of removing them. I ended up writing down almost everything the Walmart guy said to me, and I figured out a way to anonymously tip off the cops about it. Two years later, I read a news story that described how Interpol had worked on something called Operation Black Wrist, a worldwide operation that led to the arrest of abusers in America, Australia, and Thailand. I also read how it all started with an anonymous tip from somewhere in the US. I know some of you might say that I can't be certain, but I know, in my heart of hearts, that the tip was mine. And as much as I know that what I did that day was a sin, I feel like the people it helped put away, and the closure that some of the victims might have gotten, mean that in the grand scheme of things, my actions and reactions kind of balance each other out. But still, I now live with the fact that I'm a triple murderer, and it's without a doubt my deepest, darkest secret. My daughter's in her teens now, and people see me as some kind of exemplary father figure, a gentle soul who couldn't even hurt a fly. But sometimes, just sometimes, I wish they knew how wrong they were about that, and I wish I could just unburden myself of what weighs on my soul. Maybe that's why I'm writing this and sharing this. And like I said earlier, the more people that call this out as fake, the safer I feel in my mind. Because every day I get to spend with my daughter after putting everything I have at risk is nothing less than a perfect day. We're going back maybe 20 years for this story. Back when cell phones were Nokia bricks and Google Maps didn't exist. My mom used to take me with her to Walmart most trips since she didn't want to leave me home alone. I actually used to really enjoy it and most times I'd use my allowance money to buy something I wanted. I know that might sound a little strange, thinking a trip to Walmart was like an event or something, but this is living in the small town of southern Missouri, so there really wasn't exactly a lot for me to get excited about. Anyway... This one time we visited the Walmart pretty late and we happened to have one of my friends with us. About halfway into the journey, we found our regular route was closed because of some horrible drunk driving incident, so we had to find an alternative route. We weren't too concerned about this though because mom tended to be a pretty good navigator. We were more concerned about the poor family of the person in the car rack because from the way it looked, no one could have possibly have survived a crash like that. We ended up driving for like a half hour more and then my friend started to get all worried because she had a curfew. Mom assured her not to worry because there were obviously exceptional circumstances and she'd have a talk with her parents if they said that she was in trouble to make sure they understood that her being late home couldn't be helped. A short while later, she asked what time it was as she had to be home by 9.30. After checking my watch, I vividly remember telling her that it was 8.42 but then my mom overruled me and said it was 8.45 because she had just checked the clock on the dash. I remember this very, very clearly because we ended up getting into a little discussion about why the time was slightly off. Not exactly the deepest conversation ever, but it made me remember what time it roughly was, which made what happened later all the more jarring. A few minutes later, mom slows the car down and decides to turn us around because she was pretty sure she was taking us completely the wrong way. She pulls into the side of the road and I remember seeing this big metal arch with the name of some cemetery on it, something like St. Paul's or St. Jude's or something like that. Then, out of nowhere, the car just completely shut off. Engine went out, the dash lights are gone, the whole battery had just burned out in like a second. Mom tried starting the car a few times, but nothing turned. No stuttering engine, nothing. So with a sigh, she got out a pack of cigarettes from her purse and put one between her lips, obviously because she was stressing out and needed a minute to like mentally regroup or whatever. Then right as she flicked her lighter, something flashed in the car, way brighter than the spark her lighter should have made. It made my head hurt and mom actually let out an audible little chirp as we all started to complain that we had headaches. It all took place in like a fraction of a second and as weird as it was, 
We didn't think too much of it because it was all over in a short space of time. Mom then lit up her cigarette and tried the car's engine again, and that time it worked. So we started to drive off and get back on the road. My head was still kind of aching, and my friend was actually rubbing her eyes and complaining about it, so I know it wasn't just me that experienced those weird symptoms. Then a few seconds later, Mom put the brakes on real sharp and was like, What? We then asked what the problem was, if she'd seen something or whatever, and she just pointed to the clock on the dash. It only felt like a few minutes since it said 8.45, but when she pointed, the clock clearly said 11.33. At first, I figured that the time changed because the car's battery had suddenly died or whatever, but then I looked at my watch and saw that it read 11.30, still just three minutes apart, only somehow... We'd lost like three hours. We kept talking it over and assumed that we were just being paranoid. But when we got home, which was about 45 minutes from the Walmart, it really was well after 11pm. We went from feeling kind of confused about the whole thing to legitimately terrified because we had no way of explaining how we'd lost that time. To this day, neither me, my mom, or my friend have ever been able to logically explain what had happened that night. Everybody we've ever told about it just assumes that it's a made-up story, and even when we confirm it all happened to us, and we all experience the same thing, they just think we experience some kind of shared mania or something. We're not, like, traumatized by it or anything, and I mean, what choice did we have other than just to go on with our lives? No one was physically hurt by it or anything, and there must be a reasonable, rational explanation for what happened. But every so often I hear about or read about other people experiencing that same sort of time loss and I wonder if we experience the same exact phenomenon. Some people have suggested we were the victims of some kind of noxious swamp gas and that the flash was it igniting and emitting fumes that made us all pass out and kind of forget what actually happened. But I still have no idea. And if anyone has any suggestions that might explain what happened to us, I'd appreciate a DM or comment on this post to let me know. Like I said, it's not something that's given me nightmares or that affects me these days, but still, it's definitely the single most freaky thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about all the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And who up? Playing with Day Worm.